to be worshiping God with you. Uh, for those of you online or that don't know, uh, our evangelist Danny Simmons is out of town this week, and uh, I was asked to step in, so <laughs> here, here we are. We, uh, you got me this morning, so uh, if uh, you are watching at home and um, can see the link to our uh, virtual uh, visitor's card, uh, we want to ask you to, to fill that out. Uh, please do get in contact with us uh, if you have any questions about what we do, who we are, what we believe. Uh, we, we want to uh, definitely have a conversation with you about that. Conversation this morning. Have you been asking yourself recently, is, is God on my side? Is God on our side? It's a typical question that uh, believers ask and, and uh, a lot of people ask, especially during the unusual and, and challenging times that we're living in right now, we're living through. Challenges uh, often can breed anxiety and anxiety can, can breed fear. Fear is easy to adopt as a mindset. Second Timothy chapter one and verse seven tells us uh, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. And so during these times, I, as Danny has done, uh, I wanna look at a couple of passages in scripture uh, to, to encourage you, to encourage us as uh, we, we continue through the times that we're in. There's a lot of uncertainty and instability. In reality, there's always uncertainty and instability in the world. But when we go through a more unusual time, it, it reveals itself more evidently. And it can concern us. But my goal in this sermon is to uh, present to you uh, two different men uh, David and Joshua, and how they uh, both handled difficulties. And I want to present David's assured mindset in the face of trouble. And if you'll turn to Psalm 11, we'll begin there. And I want to examine David's mindset through an event involving Joshua. Together, these passages can give us a more thorough and peaceful understanding to the common natural question, is God on my side? David, of course, had many uh, severe crises in his life, and, and Psalm 11 is about God being a refuge, uh, a defender, and, and more. He talks more about God's character there. So let's go ahead and read Psalm 11, verse 1. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will, come up, will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness, and the upright will behold his face. This psalm, uh, of course, expresses uh, David's confidence in, that uh, the faithful can have in a time of crisis. It shows us how to deal with uh, the trials, how to face trials. It, it gives us a, an all-encompassing reminder of who God is and what he does and what my role before him is. In the second Part of the psalm, verses 4 through 7, 
the psalm looks beyond, the, the psalmist looks beyond the immediate danger uh, to the God who so rules all things uh, as to vindicate his righteousness and his love for the righteous, for those who keep his covenant. So in verse 1, David seeks God as his refuge. He rejoices that his soul is able to flee to God in times of trouble. Uh, I'm reading the New American Standard. Uh, your translation may be a little different. I think the Hebrew is tough to translate here. It sort of asks it as a, as a question in the second line, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird uh, to your mountain? Uh, He's, he's not saying that as a suggestion or a question, but as a, uh, as a reaction. How great it is that I can flee to your mountain. David is uh, praising God here. He's, he's praising God and thanking God and is at peace uh, in his soul and in his mind uh, that in the face of a great crisis, he can be in the comfort of God in God's hands, in the, uh, as we would say, in, in the church, in, in relationship with God. Verse 2, the, the wicked have risen up against David, and uh, he cries out to God. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. So these are wicked men who are doing things that are uh, not only unjust, but they are doing injustice to those who are just. And it is a, a, a compounded evil in that sense. In verse 3, uh, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? He goes back to the beginning. He goes back to the foundation. He extols the foundations that he has, which is God. God is his foundation, and if God is not there at the base of his soul and his mind, uh, then the very foundation of his entire being will crumble before his enemies. So he goes back, back to the basics, as we might say. What am I built upon? Where does my mind go when I face a crisis? How do I react naturally in a time of trial? And David reminds himself of the foundations, and that is a good example for us as well. Verse 4, God is in heaven. He's in his holy temple. The throne is, God's throne is in heaven. God is in control. Again, back to the foundations. God is in control. God sees the righteous. God sees the wicked. And God intimately knows of David's thoughts and feelings and his, his mindset around what he is facing. God cares and God loves us. And he provides for David in, in these times. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. As we said, God sees uh, the righteous and the wicked. Verse 5, God tests the, the righteous and the wicked. I'm sorry, God, yes, God tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Verse 6, upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire and brimstone, burning wind will be the portion of their cup. God will judge the wicked. It will be in his due time, but there is no, there is no injustice uh, with God. For the Lord is righteous, verse 7, he loves righteousness, and the upright will behold his face. Again, going back to the relationship that David uh, has with God, he can see God's face. We're talking there in a, in a spiritual sense, of course, but the righteousness of God is both what God loves and what David loves, and he is seeking that. How does this, you know, look in, in our life? How does this uh, play out exactly? Our question this morning, can I know if, if, if God is on my side during 
a crisis, during a challenge? Has he abandoned me? Does he care? Let's turn over, if you keep, keep your finger in Psalm 11, let's turn over to Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua chapter 5, Israel has camped at Gilgal, which is uh, a few miles away from Jericho. At the end of Joshua 5, Israel is about, uh, this is about the day before uh, the battle against Jericho. Jericho, of course, is, is in Canaan and has had 400 years uh, to repent and turn back to God. And they've chosen not to, and now God is using Israel to judge them. All kinds of, of, of terrible, wicked things that we don't need to go into that we know from secular history that have been done. And now the wicked will be judged. Joshua was standing there at Gilgal, and not far from Jericho, and he's, he's looking down. And in verse 13, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, remove your sandals for your feet, from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So Joshua is standing there, he's Looking down, he's probably contemplating this impending battle with Jericho. Jericho, by the way, was the first ever walled city in world history. Israel had not come across. They came through the east. They, they came uh, through and uh, battled the, the Ammonites, and uh, they had never come upon a walled city until Jericho. This is an incredibly intimidating uh, thing uh, they've never seen and they've never dealt with and so Joshua is standing looking in verse 13 uh, contemplating this probably struggling with anxiety about it who wouldn't and he looks up all of a sudden there's a man standing before him face to face and he's holding a drawn sword and Joshua asked the, the natural question, are you for us or for our enemies? And interestingly, the man says, no. <laughs> are, you, are you this or are you that? No. Which is key. The, the answer that the man gives Joshua is actually very key to the mindset that Joshua should have and that Joshua does employ, which is exactly the mindset David has in Psalm 11. And I'll get to that in just a minute. The question is, are you, are you on my side or not? As an aside, some scholars believe that uh, this man is actually Jesus. Uh, I am of that persuasion, but not everybody is. Nonetheless, this man, and for the sake of argument and, and for the sake of this sermon, uh, is at least a representative of God. I say that because he is holding authority in heaven over the, uh, the army of the Lord or the host of the Lord, depending on your translation. And Joshua bows down and, and worships him and he's not rebuked for worshiping a man. So for the sake of argument, we'll, we'll just say that this is, this is God. It represents God. The man does. Are you on my side or on my enemy's side? No. 
You see, the question for Joshua and for you and I is not whether God is on my side during a challenge, during a trial, in the midst of a crisis. Rather, the question should be, am I on God's side? Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War was asked by a Union general, or, sir, have you considered if God is on our side or not? And he said, I have not considered whether God's on our side, but if we are on his. You see, in Psalm 11 and in Joshua 5, we see the holiness of God. We see his, his justice, he is going to strike down the wicked in both texts. He is going to save the righteous in both texts. His will will be done. The onus is on me to choose to be faithful to him in obedience or not. I would argue this goes back to the Garden of Eden. What's the first question asked in all of Scripture? Is where are you? God asks Adam, right after, they, after the fall, right after they had committed sin, God asks Adam, where are you? He's not asking physically, where are you? He's trying to get Adam to consider where he is spiritually, and now he is uh, outside of the relationship of God, uh, with God. The same question is asked here. I think it's asked over and over, really, in much of Scripture. Where are you? That is what the gospel is about. I can respond to the gospel. I can consider where I am at, and I can ally myself to God in obedience, or I can kick against God and his will and go my own way or make my own uh, decision rebelling against him. So that is the real question. Is God on my side? He does not owe me his allegiance. When we are facing challenges and trials, the question is, what side am I on? Who am I looking to? Where is my mind founded? Where does my soul flee to? Again, Psalm 11 and verse 1, David says, I flee to your mountain. We do not flee or should not flee to a mountain of our own making. The man tells Joshua to remove his sandals. The, the ground that he is standing on is holy. Of course, this we can't pass by this without thinking of uh, Moses and the burning bush. Uh, Joshua, of course, was Moses' successor. Joshua did what Moses could not do and take the people into the promised land. And we have the same sort of event, uh, being in the presence of God before uh, that great event would happen. So let's turn back to Psalm 11. We will just go through what David has here for us. And again, tying this back to Joshua, tying this back to the, the commander of the Lord's army, tying this back to Joshua's mindset. And both of these can tell us, can show us, and encourage us to have the mindset uh, fully and completely in how to deal with challenges that we face today. What is the approach I should have? In uh, verse 1, the enemies of the righteous have risen up. The enemies of Israel had risen up, so to speak, against Jericho, or from Jericho. We may not have physical enemies on our doorstep, hopefully not, but we do have what I would call soft persecutions. These are things where we find weaknesses in our life. 
these are areas where we feel great stress, maybe financially, uh, with your health, with your family, many, many things. Again, Psalm 11 and verse 1, whose mountain do you flee to? You flee to God's mountain and rejoice in that and rejoice in the peace that you have to do that, and in our case, to do that through Christ. Where should the righteous go? What should they do? Well, they should not make a mountain of their own to flee to. And so many in the world do. Drugs, food, addiction, uh, self-aggrandizement, and, and a total idol. These things are totally prevalent in our culture today. And people turn to those things to allow them to be defined. and allow them a, a perceived safety and a perceived peace. And the church, we can do the same thing. And we, we are not immune to the temptations of Satan. Prayer is, of course, a natural reaction and, and should be the initial natural reaction of the righteous in any crisis. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing, that prayer be that, that habit, that natural reaction like touching a hot stove and pulling your hand away. It should be that, that quick. It should, we should be of a mind that is always ready to pray, is what that verse means. Verse 3, the righteous flee to God because they have their foundations in place. Joshua had his foundations in place. He immediately bows down and, and worships God because that's where his mind was. That's where his mindset was. We are to do the same. Hebrews 5 and verse 14 tells us we are to have our senses exercised so that we can discern good and evil. How do we exercise those senses? By being in the word by knowing what God defines as good and what God defines as evil. And then we humbly accept that that is his will. Of course, Matthew 7 and verse 25, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man's house is the wise man's mind. It is his soul. It's where he puts his soul is on the rock. The rock is the let's say, the axle around which his words and thoughts and actions spin. And, of course, verses 4 through 7, the, the Lord is in his temple. He is in control. I am not in control. I think when Joshua was standing there looking at Jericho, he realized he was not in full control. He didn't, uh, he may have had doubts. Again, an intimidating city that is walled, that you've never seen before. Therefore, it is an impossible situation. Verse 5, his eyes see the children of men. He knows what the righteous do and what the wicked do. Second Chronicles 16 and verse 9 tells us, that God's eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God created me. He knows me. He cares for me. And his son died for me. And he can see whether or not my heart is acquiescing to that call that I must come back to him in full surrender and that he may then bless me as my righteous heart repents and turns back to him. We see that in Joshua, acknowledging the authority of the man, God, and we see that here with David, fleeing to his mountain in sacrifice of whatever else he might wish to turn to. Verse 6, he certainly judges the wicked, and he will judge the wicked, going back to God's holiness and his justice. It will be carried out. In verse 7, I'm sorry, we can see that with 
Joshua and the man holding the sword and being the commander of the army. He can take out Jericho. The question is, would, will Joshua ally himself with that, with that side, with God? Verse 7, for the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness, and the upright will behold his face. Again, going back to Joshua, he stands there, this man opposite him, and he has a conversation with God. So, we can be like David, we can be like Joshua, and I, I want to encourage you and urge us all to, to do that, to have this mindset, to consider what God has done for us and what he can do and will do, both his justice and his mercy. So am I on God's side? Am I listening to God? These are the questions I should be asking. Who am I following when I say that my house is built on the rock? These are questions that, that we should consider. And as we close here, we want to offer that invitation. That is exactly what Christ is calling each and every person on earth, to come to him to obey, to be baptized and to enter a new relationship that was broken with God himself. And if you are in need of prayers, if you need to start that relationship, through baptism, we want to encourage you uh, to come forward and we would ask you to do that now as we stand and sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. A home in heaven will be my glory.